how to use technology to make aid more efficient and sustainable. How to make academia and aid organizations understand each other. How to get the private sector on board once uh, doing such a, such a partnership. These are the questions we will try to answer today. My name is Greg Castella. I'm the head of the Humanitarian Tech Hub, and I would like to warmly welcome you to today's webinar. Taking advantage of the second review conference on the Convention of Cluster Munitions, uh, we are delighted today to present FASN, the Swiss Institute of Technology, uh, contribution to peace promotion and humanitarian aid. We also would like to share the more than 10 years experience of the Accession Tech Center in uh, building meaningful partnerships between academia, non-profit organizations, and the private sector. So today's program, we will start first start with an, an introduction on the Accession Tech uh, Center and one of its uh, success stories, the Global Diagnostic uh, Project. We will then speak about uh, humanitarian aid uh, with the Humanitarian Tech Hub and a more uh, in-depth presentation of a collaboration with the ICRC, uh, the Agilis project. We will then speak about uh, the newly created Peace Tech Hub. And finally, we will have a presentation on some lessons learned uh, about building uh, partnerships between academia, uh, aid organizations, and the private sector. The last 20 minutes of uh, our webinar will be dedicated to, uh, to Q&A. So please, uh, uh, attendees, if you have questions during a presentation, do not doubt uh, to uh, write them in the, in the Q&A um, uh, tab, and we will try to answer them at the end of, uh, of our session. I also would like to let you know that this, uh, this webinar is uh, being uh, recorded. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Klaus Schoenenberger, which is the director of the Essential Tech uh, Center. Klaus, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. So let me do that. OK, uh, thank you very much, Greg. Uh, I would like to first say a few words of introduction about our institution, which is EPFL. EPFL is uh, one of the two federal institutes of technology in Switzerland. It is based in Lausanne. And as of today, we have around 11,000 students, including two, over 2,000 2, PhD students. We have 344 faculty and a staff of roughly 6,000. The Institute is organized in five schools and two colleges, including a total of over 370 labs. We have a school of life sciences, uh, one that focuses on computer and uh, communication sciences, one on architecture, civil and environmental engineering. And finally, we have a school of engineering. In addition, we have a College of Management and a College of Human and Social Sciences. Finally, we also have what we call centers, whose mission is transversal. The Essential Tech Center is one of those, and I will briefly introduce it to you. Our mandate is to harness science and technology to drive sustainable development, support humanitarian action, and foster peace. There is one foundational question which has been guiding our work ever since we started our activities uh, a little bit less than 10 years ago. How can we achieve a sustainable and large scale impact? We have developed a complete methodology which strives to respond to this question. Before giving you the key elements of that methodology, I would like to say a few words about the role of technology and the importance of the context. We believe that technology can be an enabler. However, technology alone is by no means a silver bullet against poverty or vulnerability. Also, we need to consider the influence that the context has on technology. At Essential Tech, we focus primarily on the African continent, where there is a concentration of poverty, humanitarian crisis, and conflict. The context in many African regions is obviously quite different from what we have in industrialized countries. 
there are four main differences in the perspective of technology. The first is a lack of financial resources, uh, which sounds obvious, but which affects not only the ability to pay for the technology, but also for maintenance and consumables. The second is a lack of skilled personnel able to properly use, maintain, and repair the technology. The third is a lack of quality infrastructure, which may also have been destroyed uh, due to conflict, etc. Electrical power is unstable, there is no access to water, sanitation is an issue, roads are in bad shape, etc. And finally, there is a harsh climate with high temperatures, uh, humidity, and dust. Due to these differences, if technologies designed for industrialized countries are simply sent there, the effect is the following. This picture shows donated medical devices in the backyard of a hospital in Malawi. Unfortunately, according to the World Health Organization, over 70% of donated electrical medical devices are never commissioned. So how can we change this? We need to rethink technologies and their deployment models so that they are truly adapted to this context. As we aim for a sustainable impact, our first step is precisely to understand the context. And there is no better way than to collaborate with local stakeholders who are confronted to these problems every day. This includes NGOs and local universities. We need to co-develop solutions together with them. The first pillar of our approach is thus cooperation. We then need to demonstrate the technological feasibility of our innovation. Uh, and that's something that we know how to do at EBFL, but that's not enough. We also need to develop a sustainable deployment model, a viable business model. The complexity of such projects requires that multiple disciplines be mobilized. Our second pillar is thus interdisciplinarity. The next step is then to transfer the technology either to a startup company, which we create for the occasion, or to an existing partner in the private sector who will industrialize and scale up the technology. The third pillar is thus entrepreneurship. The key to the success in this process is to de-risk the project before the transfer to the private sector. And we all know that the best antidote against risk is knowledge. And we generate, and to generate this knowledge, we need cooperation and interdisciplinarity. I will end on this note with a call for ideas and partnerships. Please get in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Klaus, for this uh, presentation and uh, to, to explain us how science, technology, and entrepreneurship can, uh, can contribute to, uh, to, uh, to development. Now, in order to illustrate those uh, concepts, uh, we will uh, dive into a specific, uh, a specific case, which is the Global Diagnostic uh, Project. I would like to introduce Dr. Uh, Soli Makolisho, uh, uh, who will, who will uh, actually present us uh, the, the Global Diagnostic uh, Project. Soli, the floor is yours. Thank you, Craig. And my name is Soli Makoliso. I serve as the um, uh, Deputy Director of the Essential Tech um, Center. And what I want to do over the next few minutes is just to give you a concrete example of uh, some of the principles that uh, were discussed by my colleague just before. Now, okay, I'm just trying to get my I just have a technical problem to the next slide. Can you see the next slide? Uh, not yet, we see the first one, uh, Soli. Yeah, it's frozen. Uh, Maybe go out of presentation mode. Yeah, okay. I'm just, yeah, I'm sure it's frozen. Then. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. yeah, let's take the example of the X-ray uh, technology, for example, that some, I think most of you know uh, uh, about X-ray and have used it at some point. And it was actually, it's something that was discovered 125 years ago by a Swiss engineer, in fact, uh, Röntgen. However, 
still two thirds of humanity have no access to this technology today. And whereas it is such an essential tool that is required in many developing countries, because it is uh, very vital, for example, for the management of uh, traumatic injuries that you find in road accidents. And uh, as we know, uh, we have about 50 million um, uh, road accidents every year and 90% of those occur in low and middle income countries, precisely the region where we don't actually have access to this tool. And then of course it is used and uh, uh, to assist with uh, uh, the diagnosis of various pulmonary diseases and notably tuberculosis uh, and pneumonia and both of which are top causes of mortality of um, children and adults in developing countries. Now, the question begs as to why we don't have this access to this, uh, uh, to such a, a, an important uh, tool even today. Now, in order to try and answer that, let's go back to uh, uh, the notion that was discussed by my colleague just before, uh, the question, the notion of those four horsemen that he showed us just before. And the first one relates to the lack of financial resources. It turns out that in fact, uh, the total uh, cost of ownership, if you compute the total cost of ownership of the typical X-ray machines that you find in developing countries, which are a film-based system, it, it is considerably, it is almost 10 times higher than the original purchase price because you have to factor in the consumables that are needed, such as the X-ray films and the chemical reagents, you have to factor in the, 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 the compulsory uh, uh, maintenance contracts that are, are imposed by many of these um, manufacturers. And, um, and all of this has escalates, and according to our estimates, uh, over a 10 year period, such a system can come up to almost half a million Swiss francs, which is over 10 times the original seemingly low uh, uh, price uh, that you pay at the beginning. Of course, we have the problem of uh, lack of trained personnel. For example, in, in a country such as uh, Cameroon, which has 20 million, which is a population of 20 million people, you only have 10 radiologists that are trained uh, a year and most of who uh, actually end up leaving the country in search of uh, greener pastures. And then of course, there's the uh, issue of lack of, uh, of poor and lack of quality infrastructures. And there I think you quickly think of uh, the frequent power outages that are, are prevalent in these places and the insufficient capacity that you find in hospitals. And it turns out that in fact, uh, over one third of the damage that occurs to medical equipment in, in, in hospital arises from these type of electrical instabilities. The, lack, the poor or complete lack of uh, uh, IT infrastructure as exemplified by this pathetic uh, uh, image in front of us. And of course, uh, uh, my colleague referred to the hot, humid and dusty environment. This is an example of what happens to, to, to an instrument under such conditions. So we embarked on an ambitious project to, to try and innovate a solution that could effectively address these challenges. Uh, this was in fact uh, our first flagship uh, project as a center and involved over 20 labs in uh, both in Switzerland and Africa. And more importantly, it also had a joint project lead leadership consisting of a Swiss engineer and a Cameroonian radiologist. And now the outcome of this was a totally new uh, uh, X-ray system with the following uh, adapted features. Its total cost of ownership was five to six times less uh, than the standard traditional uh, um, uh, um, X-ray systems that we find in developing countries. And it is fully digital. Sorry. It obviously has been, uh, we have also made sure that it's robust and can resist all these uh, issues of heat and humidity and dust. And uh, it, uh, it, it, it consumes about 300 watts, which is almost a hundred times than a traditional machine. And it's designed to resist power sags and instabilities and can function also during power outages. And now of course, uh, and 
because of this, uh, this uh, uh, to achieve all these uh, uh, challenges and overcome all these innovations, we require this required significant innovations and actually resulted in three patterns. But technology innovation in itself was not enough. We also had to rethink the business model and studied the entire value chain. All this culminated in the creation of a startup company uh, called Pristem, which was able to raise a record round A um, of 14 million Swiss francs, which came from both Swiss and African investors. And now to conclude, um, I hope I have succeeded in convincing you that we've, you know, we've uh, how we've implemented the, the three pillars that uh, uh, Dr. Schonenberger mentioned too. For example, in the case of uh, uh, the first one is cooperation, and, uh, and a good example of this is the strategy we adopted in uh, uh, implementing a joint project leadership between a, a Swiss engineer and a Cameroonian doctor. Uh, multi and interdisciplinarity, as I mentioned, this involved over 20 labs, uh, uh, both here and uh, both in Switzerland and in Africa, but more importantly, uh, and many other stakeholders and players outside the, inter, um, uh, the academic sector. And of course, um, and there is the third pillar of entrepreneurship through the innovation of a more adapted business model and the creation of a company to serve as, the conduit, uh, as our conduit to universal access and large scale impact. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Soli, for sharing this amazing uh, success story with, uh, with us. And uh, I would like to take advantage also to wish all good success to the, the startup that was created uh, uh, out of uh, Global Diagnostic. And also to say that at some point, uh, it's not in the hand of the academia anymore, but it's uh, the private sector who, who takes over. And I think it's a quite a, a natural, uh, natural step. So now I would like to uh, tell you a little bit more about humanitarian aid. So let me share my screen here. So I would like to uh, tell you about the humanitarian tech hub. Can you give me one second? Yes. All right. So first, a couple of words about uh, context. Unfortunately, over the last years, we saw an increase in terms of humanitarian needs. According to uh, the 2020 um, humanitarian review from, the, from, the, from OCHA, the Coordination Office of the United Nations, uh, in 2019, there's been around 70 million uh, people displaced uh, because of conflict and uh, situation of, uh, of insecurity. To this, uh, add the, the, the higher frequency of extreme climate events, like flood, storm, or drought, that actually affect those displaced population more than other, uh, than other population. And finally, uh, this year, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is putting at risk uh, the, the hard fought one in terms of uh, poverty reduction or, or access to healthcare uh, that were gained during the last, uh, the last uh, decade. The COVID-19 pandemic uh, is also has the potential also to derail uh, the, um, the effort of several countries in terms of reaching the, the SDG. So it's a, it's a, it's a rather uh, gloomy uh, situation that we, see, uh, that we see at the moment. However, there is a rather contrasting uh, reality to this, which is the fourth industrial revolution. There is an increase, uh, 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 an incredibly uh, high pace of innovation at the moment. We all have in our pocket a mobile phone that is actually a microcomputer that can give us access to a huge amount of information and that can run machine learning uh, algorithms. Or we also, in terms of healthcare, also there's been uh, uh, innovation in the field of, uh, of gene therapy, for example, or digital health. And there is many different fields that are actually uh, positively impacted by the, by the innovations of the fourth industrial uh, revolution. You can say self-driving vehicles or 3D printing, drones, artificial intelligence. So I just wanted to highlight this kind of contrasting, uh, contrasting uh, reality. 
Now, the, in order to try to reconcile those two uh, realities, uh, we created the Humanitarian Tech Hub, which mission is to mobilize science and technology in order to contribute to a more efficient and inclusive uh, humanitarian aid delivery. Really, the idea is that all this innovation uh, also benefits the most, uh, the most uh, vulnerable, in particular, those ones affected by conflict and, uh, and natural uh, catastrophes. We are working on three uh, different focus areas. The first one being digital trust and privacy. We have, in particular, some projects related with, uh, with biometry or with weaponization of, uh, of information. The second one is digital health, where we see a very good fit between the, um, the, the area of expertise of the PFL and the needs of humanitarian organizations. And finally, energy, water, and environmental footprint, because given the magnitude of the climate crisis today, I mean, all organizations have to kind of adapt and deal with the consequences of, uh, of uh, climate change. So here again, there is a good fit between the, between the expertise of PFL and, uh, and the priorities of, uh, of organization. Uh, a few words about the history of the, of the hub. It was actually created in 2016 as an original partnership between PFL and the ICRC. Uh, and in, 2000, in 2020, so actually I arrived a couple of months ago as, uh, as head of the humanitarian tech hub. Our, our objective is to broaden the scope of the hub uh, and to not only strengthen the partnership with the ICRC, but also to bring more humanitarians around the, around the table. So please, if you are working with a humanitarian organizations and that you see uh, needs that, you could, uh, that we could work together on solving, please do not doubt to, uh, to reach out. Now, two projects I would like to uh, shortly speak about uh, that were the result of the, of the humanitarian uh, tech hub. First one is Agilis. It's a collaboration between the ICRC and, uh, and the PFL in order to develop an affordable carbon fiber food uh, process. Uh, Gregorio uh, will uh, speak more about it in, uh, in a minute. The second one is it's called Smart PPE, and it's to develop uh, personal protective equipment for, for Ebola. So as you know, Ebola is very contagious, and it often happens in places that are quite uh, humid and, and warm and uh, which makes the, the, the wearing of protective equipment uh, quite of a constraint for healthcare workers. So together with the uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, we decided to develop uh, an innovative uh, protective equipment, which is reusable. So it's, it's also it's easier in terms of uh, supply chain, which is integrated, so easier to put in and to remove, which also reduces the risk of uh, contamination during those uh, crucial uh, steps. And finally, ventilated in order to make sure that the healthcare workers are more comfortable and then able to deliver a better quality of care to, uh, to Ebola patients. So those are the two projects I wanted to, uh, to highlight. Uh, so that will be it uh, for me. Uh, now uh, I would like to introduce um, Gregory uh, Uo, which is uh, um, Product Development Manager uh, at, the, uh, at the ICRC and who will uh, let us know about and give us more detail about the uh, Agilis uh, project. Uh, Gregory, the floor is yours. Thank you for the uh, introduction, Greg, and, and thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to present this uh, advanced food project uh, today. Screen better. Um, First, you can see here uh, typical prosthetic components you, you may find in uh, high income countries. Uh, you can see here a uh, uh, microprocessor activated knee, uh, bionic hand, uh, expensive materials like carbon fiber, titanium, uh, making all these components uh, very expensive, uh, but we can afford them in high income countries, uh, especially because we also have health insurance is to, uh, uh, to support um, this business. Um, it's a pretty different situation where the ICRC operates and to a larger extent in uh, low and lower middle income countries. Uh, you can see the typical components that the, ICR, uh, the ICRC is using uh, uh, in its field of operations. Um, it's less high tech, of course, but it remains appropriate uh, uh, 
Um, these components are based on polypropylene, uh, making them durable and uh, adapted to the context of use. The same applies for uh, prosthetic feet as well. And uh, this project targets uh, K3 level users. Uh, by this, I mean patients who have a higher mobility, mobility requirement and who need so-called dynamic foot. Um, on the left side, you can see uh, the prosthetic feet we are using at the ICRC, which are made of a internal PP keel, which is rigid and a polyurethane foam. Um, unfortunately, these feet do not feature a, a natural feet movement as they are rigid, but thanks to their cushioning ability due to the foam, uh, um, we can fit uh, all patients without uh, any risk to harm them because this foam acts as a cushion uh, to prevent further damage of remaining joints. You can see it's pretty cheap. On the other end, uh, this is uh, a typical uh, prosthetic foot you might find uh, in uh, high income countries with advanced biomechanics uh, like uh, ankle movement and uh, the ability to uh, store and release energy during gait, which provides an extra push uh, uh, to, uh, to the patient when he walks. Um, this is mainly achieved through uh, uh, carbon composites like the blade you can see here, uh, which uh, uh, provides push during uh, uh, load and unload uh, cycles. Here you can see a summary of, uh, of the, the project in itself. Um, advanced feeds, uh, advanced uh, property feeds uh, are uh, found in, uh, in premium segments. Um, they are very expensive and uh, not affordable uh, to a vast majority of people uh, living in low and lower middle income countries. Uh, on the uh, horizontal axis, you can see a, a, a scale with uh, four different levels ranging from low mobility to high mobility and sports prosthesis. Uh, this is the segment that we target uh, and the goal of this project, uh, as you can see, the price range here is in the range of a few thousand uh, US dollars or uh, Swiss francs. Uh, we wanted to have uh, such a food such properties available in a foot that would cost around a hundred dollars. This is the final prototype, which is patent pending and that has been uh, developed during that project. Um, you can see on the left image, the internal part, uh, which is made of a, a, a carbon um, composite blade and an ankle part, uh, which also contain carbon fibers. Thanks to the uh, grade and type of materials used, as well as the processing routes, uh, we managed to, uh, to keep the, the production costs low and, and meet the target of 100 uh, Swiss francs. And you can see that this keel, this internal part here, is encapsulated in foams. Uh, um, this is a protection uh, for the context of use. So it prevents damaging this internal part, which is the core of, uh, of uh, the foot itself. We went to uh, Vietnam in uh, 2016, where uh, we did a preclinical uh, trial with 11 patients there. Um, people uh, were fitted with either uh, the traditional uh, foam foot or this one, it was, uh, it was randomized, of course. And uh, we had them train and, and do some tests at the physical rehabilitation center in Hanoi before going back home for 40 hour, 48 hours uh, wearing uh, inertia measurements units that were recording all movements that patients were uh, doing. What we saw, uh, and, uh, which is a, a promising result, is that people tended to work first uh, more often. If you compare the walking bouts every day with these new food people tended to walk more often. And uh, when you have a closer look to the walking bouts duration, 
we also uh, saw that uh, people tended to work for a longer time, meaning to our understanding that they were quite confident with this new food. And um, this is the basis for uh, uh, the next steps, which are first long-term uh, field tests at a large scale in different contexts in the world to get more clinical evidence. Uh, we want to uh, be sure um, that uh, this, uh, this prototype uh, provides uh, what is meant to provide to, um, to our beneficiaries. Once we can prove it's efficient, relevant, and appropriate in this different context, uh, we will go through the product certification, which is uh, needed uh, uh, to put this on the market. It's a medical device class, class one. I told you um, that the, this food is patent pending for now, and we have just entered the national phase, uh, which is uh, which is new uh, for us at the ICRC. It's the first time uh, we do own a patent, which is still not granted. But, uh, we are uh, going through the steps of uh, registering this patent, and then the last step will be the scale up. And for this, uh, for now, we uh, plan to do this through a partnership. Why? Because currently we are facing some challenges. Um, the partnership with the EPFL uh, uh, was uh, very efficient and fruitful uh, in the sense that uh, uh, we got this, uh, this prototype in a rather short time span uh, available. And it was successfully tested uh, with a, a limited range of uh, patients uh, in Vietnam. Uh, what we see now is that there is still, of course, engineering needed to, um, to industrialize uh, these uh, this projects and, and, and for the scale up. Um, and currently also due to the uh, COVID-19 situation, there's a bit of a loss of momentum. Uh, there are uh, advanced manufacturing uh, technologies uh, which are needed, as well as uh, consequent uh, investments. This is why uh, at this stage, uh, we still uh, uh, strongly believe that we will succeed in uh, finding the right manufacturing partner. Thanks to these first results, the, the, the following results we have from the next clinical trials and the, the patent ownership uh, we do have currently. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, Gregory, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, sharing this, uh, this uh, success uh, story uh, with, together between, uh, between ICRC and, uh, and OBFL. Now we will turn uh, to a topic that is, uh, that is of special interest to uh, our audience uh, from, the, from the conference on the cluster munition, which is uh, peace promotion. Uh, within the Essential Tech Center, a new unit has been uh, recently uh, created, uh, which is the Peace Tech uh, Hub. So I would like to introduce Dr. Maria Sel Makeda, uh, who will uh, tell us more about the, about the hub. Maria Sel, take it from here. Thank you very much, uh, Greg. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for this interesting um, presentation. My name is Maria Thelma Queda Lopez, and I'm the head of the Peace Tech Division at the Essential Tech Center. This division has been recently created uh, to be able to address in a more coherent and comprehensive way the existing needs of vulnerable communities. Nowadays, the recurrent and protracted um, crisis uh, makes that uh, many complex factors are inter deeply interlinked and uh, making um, development, uh, humanitarian and peace nexus was needed to improve our own uh, coping capacities and to contribute to long-term resilience. Um, first of all, I would like to contextualize a little bit the global state of peace. In order to do this, I'm going to present you some results from the Global Peace Index uh, of 2020. Here you can see the level of country peacefulness for the countries under study. You can see the different colors with the different uh, uh, 
risks and, uh, and peaceful level, it has been uh, found in this study that the average level of global country peacefulness has deteriorated this year by 0.34% and that the economic impact of violence in 2020, it has been of, of uh, around $14.5 trillion. That means an equivalent to $2,000 per person. Um, there are other references to studies uh, which uh, have uh, other kind of information, complementary information, but I, will, I wanted to show you this one because um, this, this study and all the studies in peace uh, research show the need uh, to promote peace as a, as a first uh, priority all over the world. Uh, speaking about priorities, I wanted to show you some of the more urgent uh, ones. These are to implement and sustain peace agreements, to ensure livelihood the needs of populations affected by conflict, to promote dialogue and peaceful coexistence, and to address risks of conflicts. Actually, here you can see that uh, all these uh, priorities are uh, transversal to many disciplines. So the need for uh, partnership, it is a pretty urgent priority as well. Um, not to say that uh, the promotion of peace, justice, and strong institutions is one of the sustainable development goals, the SDG 16. And so if we want to be able to accomplish the Agenda 2030 from now, 2030, we have to boost the implementation, the design and the implementation of peace promoting activities. Um, for those that are not uh, familiar with the framework, here I, I wanted to present you uh, the most used classification for peace promoting activities. There are five categories mainly peace enforcement, peacemaking, peacekeeping, peace building, and conflict prevention. Um, I would like to address a question here, and it is in which of these categories we can apply peace tech in a better way? And um, I have to tell you that this, the answer is really easy. Peace tech, it is a natural driver to um, complement or to lead solutions uh, for each of these categories to prevent violence, reduce uh, conflicts, and promote peace. And actually there are many working technologies already um, that have been already implemented in each of these categories, but uh, there is uh, there are really promising opportunities and uh, a huge uh, room for improvement in this tech. So having said this, I would like to invite you to see which are the pillars on which we are going to build this new division. Our vision it is to contribute with technology innovations, as uh, my colleagues have presented, some of them, that enable better prevention, monitoring, containment, and extinction of conflicts. And in order to do this, our mission it is team up. We would like to team up with interdisciplinary experts to leverage knowledge and co-develop well-framed peace tech projects together. And um, we have in mind already some uh, early stage initiatives that are, are being um, co-created and co-developed. One of them, it is development of a multi-risk analyzed platform to prevent conflict. And the other one, it is uh, the use of information sharing platforms to promote peace in the media, what we have called uh, TV for Peace. Um, this uh, division is pretty new. So for us, the next steps, it is to find the correct projects and the correct partners in order to be able to add uh, the tech uh, to the peace promotion. Um, I didn't mention some aspects about the division, but I hope that we are going to have some extra time during the Q&A uh, section. So please don't hesitate to write your questions in the chat if you have any. And thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you so much, uh, Maria Estelle, for your, uh, for your presentation and, uh, and wishing you uh, all the best uh, luck in, uh, in building the Peace Tech, uh, the Peace Tech Hub.
Now, as a conclusion, uh, we will get some uh, secret recipes to make a happy wedding uh, between academia and, uh, and humanitarian uh, organizations. So in the role of chef, I would like to introduce uh, Louis Potter, who is the co-founder of uh, Outside International and a seasoned uh, humanitarian innovation uh, practitioner. So Louis, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Greg. Uh... Hi everyone. So um, I'm going to talk to you today um, about why some academic and humanitarian partnerships fail and why others succeed and hopefully how this can be improved. Um, I think it's a positive step that there's critical self-evaluation going on. Um, you know, it's not saying that all of these work, but it's trying to understand what makes, as Greg says, you know, what's, what's a good recipe for success. Um, just so you know, this presentation comes from an article uh, that is currently under review um, and we hope will be published shortly. Um, the co-authors are Dika Kalubi at ICRC um, and Klaus Schoenenberger at Central Tech. So what's the background? Okay, so I've, I've personally worked for um, a number of years uh, conducting meta reviews of in innovation partnerships for humanitarian organizations. Um, during this time, we've looked at literally hundreds of partnerships, um, all producing various different types of tools or hardware that could be biomedical, it could be uh, e-care, it could be logistics, drones, these kind of things. Many of them fail, um, but we wanted to know why they fail. So um, a while back, we ran a workshop with the humanitarian, uh, with some humanitarian and academic actors that aim to investigate this. One of the first, first things we thought was very important to do was try and understand what success means in these kind of partnerships. Um, and the, the definition that we kind of settled on is around having a scaled and sustainable uh, intervention. That is something that's going to continue beyond the duration of just the research or, de or development phase of the partnership. So we want to know what's going wrong. Um, through these analysis, we sort of came up with three main areas that we thought were um, relevant or, or particularly where the pain points were. These were resources, these were scale deployment and roles and responsibilities. And here you can see I've taken the marriage analogy probably a little too far. Um, so starting with resources, um, I think the first thing we need to know is you get what you pay for. Um, if you're going to fund uh, a project and it's only going to fund as far as a pilot or a proof of concept, that's basically what you're going to end up with. I mean, of course, you can try and find um, additional funds later on, but it's, it can be quite hard uh, and the, the partnership can run out of steam. So, you know, really plan, plan ahead for, you know, what's the aim. And uh, this is very closely linked to the early stages of an initi initiative, which is around this scoping and landscaping of the problem. And um, so that's really trying to understand what's currently out there in terms of technology what does the NGO partner really want to get out of this in terms of uh, outcome, you know, scale, but to what extent and for who? Um, but also assessing technologies in the sense of, okay, how, how ready is this technology to be deployed um, in the field? Um, and we've definitely seen cases where maybe NGOs jumped too quickly on a technology. Uh, and then as a result, it turns out that that technology isn't appropriate for the context that they're working and then resources are wasted as a result. Finally, I think it's important to note that NGOs tend to work on short-term budget cycles, so it can be pretty hard to plan ahead, uh, particularly for a multi-year uh, research project that academia might do uh, more commonly. The question about reaching scale um, is, is again a very important one, uh, and there's lots of different options here. You could uh, potentially try and spin out um, a company, uh, as we've seen a central tech do in some cases, um, you could look for donor funding for that transition to scale. There's, there's organizations like Grand Challenge Canada or the Humanitarian Innovation Fund who have explicit funds for, for scaling innovations. Or maybe you could go the research funding route and try and sort of replicate your research in, in different contexts. It's just very important here to, to know what the options are. Um, and I think uh, particularly from the NGO and, and academic point of view, it can be quite hard to really understand how you reach that kind of sustainability. Um, also here, I think it's important to say that maybe the divergent aims of NGOs and academia comes more to the fore. Uh, generally, I think NGOs are looking for this replicable scale um, impact, uh, whereas academia you know, is looking, broadly speaking, to you know, uh, further scientific investigation and produce published articles. So maybe here there, there tends to be a bit of a disconnect. 
the final the final area we we're looking into uh, was roles and responsibilities or sort of expectations. So I think one of the things here we we saw is that NGOs. Uh, we think often head to the academic uh, sector for collaboration um, because they're a bit scared of the commercial sector. I think that's quite a deep-rooted and, and long-term problem. I think quite a good example of this is if a, if a commercial sector partner is talking about profitability in terms of producing a product or a service that can uh, continue to, to function in terms of updates and training and these kind of things in the future, that's generally seen profitability as the term is seen as quite negative uh, by the NGOs. But instead, if the, if the partner's talking about uh, sustainable uh, products or services, that's more acceptable. So there's a bit of a translation issue there. I think it's also fair to say that this is uh, the area, particularly on these later stages of development, where NGOs uh, get out of their comfort zone. Uh, inside NGOs and, and IOs, that there's not necessarily um, the knowledge base around intellectual property, licensing or price points, these kind of things that would normally uh, form the foundation of making these decisions. Uh, and I think as a result, uh, quite often NGOs tend to make quite rash decisions when it comes to how to distribute or you know, reach this uh, sustainability point. And finally, I think there's a, a general sense within uh, uh, NGOs, which is maybe a little naive, which is that they they see academia as, as this sort of purely virtuous pursuit. And I think actually now, if you look at the way that universities have commercialization uh, departments who are dealing with intellectual property, with licensing, these kind of things, uh, I think NGOs maybe get a bit wrong footed later on uh, and are a bit surprised by how commercial it, it all sounds. So it's not all doom and gloom. Um, we try and offer some uh, key key findings or key advice. Um, obviously, there's more details in, in the article and, and some other work that we've done. Um, but I think the three main points are, number one, choose a partner wisely. So this is where the early scoping stage is really essential. You really need to think about what you want to achieve, where you want to get to, and who you want to do that with. Don't just jump into a partnership because it seems uh, convenient. The next one is to plan ahead. So budget properly uh, for scale, or you're not gonna get there. As we said before, if you only have the budget for a proof of concept or a pilot or a prototype, it's not gonna reach the beneficiaries that you want it to. And then the final one, which is know your limitations and try and fill these. So this goes both ways. Um, for, for academia, I think it's, a, it's having a real understanding of what NGOs or IOs are looking for in these partnerships. And that is around this replicable scale uh, question, which is quite often an, a little bit outside of the academic pursuit of new discovery. So understanding that is, is a real key. And then the second part is for NGOs to try and fill their knowledge gaps around intellectual property, licensing, ownership, and these kind of business models that are required for sustainable innovation. So uh, that's with that, um, I'll say thank you. Uh, if you want to get in touch, please, please don't hesitate and I'll hand back over to Greg. All right, thank you so much, Louis, for those uh, insightful, uh, insightful uh, lesson. And it's true that uh, this, this um, building a partnership between uh, academia, org uh, aid organizations and the private sector is, can be quite a bumpy road and uh, and uh, yeah, we believe at the Essential Tech that we're kind of ideally placed between academia, organizations, and, uh, and uh, entrepreneurship in order to support organizations and making sure that uh, they pick the right, part the right projects and the right partnerships and that they, uh, they, uh, they, they, well, they, they increase the, the likelihood of, uh, of, uh, of success. So thank you very much for this, uh, for this uh, presentation. Uh, now we have uh, around 10 minutes to go to uh, question and answers. So uh, I will try to uh, pick a couple of those ones uh, that have been posted in the question and answer. Um, so the first one uh, is related to, um, let me find it, sorry, one second. Uh, So it was a question that was targeting a question from uh, Yoon uh, Takazawa. 
and which was uh, targeting, uh, which was for uh, the Agilis uh, project, uh, so, uh, so to Gregory Uo, and he was asking whether in this project uh, you had like, uh, did you reach out to other uh, organizations and also to a local partner in order to do a, a, a know-how uh, transfer? Gregory, if you want to unmute yourself. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, um, are you referring? Yeah, I think I have answered this question. Uh, uh, we do, uh, as ICRC, of course, uh, uh, partnerships and discussions with many different actors, ranging from manufacturers, uh, the academia, NGOs, local partners, and a Ministry of Health, because we do have a multi-level approach uh, um, to bring uh, support to affected populations. And of course, these uh, different uh, partners and stakeholders uh, uh, bring us uh, a question as well as solutions when, uh, uh, when we have to develop a new product. And, and uh, just to keep in mind that uh, uh, we are still talking about uh, medical devices and uh, there are uh, certifications and norms and. Uh, a lot of different things we need to take into account. Uh, for now, all the components we do produce are made in Switzerland in that short form uh, through a social business model with the foundation there where uh, uh, people with disabilities manufacture uh, all these components for other people with disabilities uh, globally in a, a conflict affected areas. Uh, you can just uh, check the rehabimpulse.org website, which explains the whole story about this. All right, thank you very much, uh, uh, Gregory. Now, uh, I'd like to pick a question from uh, Marie-Philippe uh, Van Hames. Uh, sorry for the mispronunciation, uh, in case it's not uh, pronounced well. Uh, so the question is uh, about Agilis and Smart PPE. How did you choose uh, to prioritize these uh, projects? And what are other ones in the pipeline? So in the panel, is there somebody who would like to answer this question? Okay. So maybe uh, uh, first Soli and then Klaus. So about yes. prioritization. There are various ways in which um, uh, we carry out this process. Uh, in some cases, if you talk about the ones that you uh, specifically made, uh, this was through various discussions that actually happened with some of the organizations uh, such as ICRC, uh, who had seen this challenge and wanted uh, had a concrete challenge that needed to be overcome. And so uh, we, and uh, it actually fitted with the type of project that uh, we look, we like to work at on uh, TPFL. Uh, that was the same thing also with uh, uh, um, uh, Smart PPE, which was a project that was, that came from, um, you know, uh, uh, Metz MSF here in Switzerland, uh, due to the challenges that they had seen after the last Ebola outbreak. Uh, we do have uh, a few projects that are in the pipeline. Maybe I'll let uh, my colleague uh, uh, Klaus, um, you know, uh, add a few words on on this, and uh, maybe um, summarize the projects that we have in the pipeline as well. Yeah, so I'm not sure I can summarize all the projects we have in the pipeline. That's a bit a bit much. I would really uh, recommend to go to our website. But one thing that is really important about this question is. Uh, in terms of prioritization, I think what what do we base it uh, on, upon whether we start a project or not? And I think the, the the starting point has to be an unmet need, a very a very big unmet need, and the recognition of a of a, uh, a a problem. And we often get approached by humanitarians, actually, uh, whom some of us call problem owners. <laughs> I don't know if you can say that uh, in a respectful way, but. Uh, you know, that's where it has to start. We cannot start, and this is maybe to turn the, th the question around. Uh, for me, it's very difficult to start with, with a technology because uh, uh, then you are in this situation of uh, having a hammer looking for a nail. And we try to avoid this because uh, it ends up uh, uh, creating 
uh, imperfect and, and, and not good matches be, between the problem itself and uh, the tool that you put in front of it. I think that's, that's as much as I can say about this. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Klaus. Uh, now uh, we have five minutes left, so maybe one or two uh, additional uh, questions. So uh, there is one here um, uh, from uh, anonymous uh, uh, attendee, which is, how do you imagine the humanitarian practices of the future, more sustainable and involving more local players? So that's a question that uh, I would like to, uh, to uh, contribute to answer uh, myself. Um, really, we would like the humanitarian tech hub to actually respond to priorities of uh, humanitarian uh, organizations. And so we would like to kind of enable or facilitate the transformation of the, of the humanitarian sector. And as it's pointed in the, in the, in the question, it's uh, uh, very probable that um, the future landscape of, uh, of uh, humanitarian action is more diversified, including some uh, remaining large international organizations, but also a more important role of, uh, of local uh, responder to, uh, to humanitarian, uh, humanitarian crisis. So we also hope that we can, we can help uh, the, 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 the sector, uh, we can help use technology uh, to enable uh, part of the sector uh, transformation. And then the second one uh, related to, uh, to sustainability. It's also true that I, I spoke a little bit about it during my presentation, but uh, the climate crisis is, such, uh, is, is, is so big at the moment that all organizations have also to uh, prioritize reducing that footprint and, uh, and dealing, with, uh, dealing with, uh, with, the, with the consequences of the crisis. So, so uh, to answer your question short, yes, I think it will go in this direction and we hope that we can accompany this, uh, this change. So maybe one uh, last uh, question. Um, I saw one about uh, peace. Let me find it again. Um, sorry. So, uh, so maybe it's a question directed to Maria Sel. So how would you define peace? Absence of uh, war seems a necessary but not a sufficient uh, condition. Well, it is a tough one to finish. Uh, I would say that um, as peace is a social uh, consensus, everyone has a different definition for peace and that is kind of uh, a mistake when you are trying to work in, uh, in peace promotion. I'm going to maybe um, refer to Johan Galtung, that is the father of the peace research and peace studies. And he defined peace not only as the absence of violence in the streets, but as the um, positive contribution to the resolution uh, beforehand of the social tensions and the conflicts. So it is not just to not to see war; it is also to think uh, in the possi possible problems that we can have and conflicts we can have with uh, uh, gender inequality, race inequality, human rights, all the social tensions that are behind the door and uh, that are not uh, already fighting in the streets and, uh, and uh, addressing as well. So it is uh, this, this two double definition, not to have violence for sure, but also to be positive in this um, upfolding uh, um, approach uh, uh, to, to resolve it and to prevent conflicts. Um, I hope that this a valid definition for everyone. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Maria Sel, for this, uh, for this definition. And as you said, there is, uh, there is various definitions. So thanks a lot for this, uh, for this uh, summary. So now I would like to, uh, to conclude just to, uh, yeah, to repeat that we, uh, we all know that technology is not a silver bullet but uh, that it can act as, a, as an enabler for more, more efficient and sustainable uh, aid sector. And we would like to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to contribute to it with, uh, with uh, essential, uh, essential tech. I also would like to remind our, yeah, you wanted to say something, Maria? Sir? I wanted to say that there are many other questions in the chat, so maybe we are going to answer them. And so we have the contacts of the participants to, to send an answer because I can see a lot and we don't have that much time, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, the, we don't have time to answer all the questions, so we will uh, uh, revise them and get in touch with those people that, uh, that ask the questions. 
Uh, I would like also to uh, well to let you know that on our uh, mini site that I'm posting now on the on the chat, you will find a showcase of showcase of uh, different uh, projects, uh, uh, labs projects of AVPFL that have a potential in uh, in peace promotion and humanitarian aid. We will find short videos of professors explaining their their projects. So I would like also to take advantage to thank all those professors for, for taking the time to, uh, to record those short uh, videos. And I also uh, would like to share my screen now with our contacts. Um, so one second, here it is. Oops, yeah, voila. Okay, so uh, just to let you know that uh, uh, if you want to, to uh, get in touch, uh, you can uh, go on our website or send us a message to one of those uh, different emails or to follow us on uh, on uh, social uh, social media as well. So I would like to thank our panelists and our attendees for today's uh, session. And uh, and yeah, thank you very much. And uh, we hope to uh, get in touch uh, soon. Thank you and bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye.